I'm here with uh, Christopher Griffiths and Gary Smart, uh, directors of Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, the Robert England story. Um, I, I've seen you guys have done a lot of these, and you got another one coming out of uh, RoboCop, I believe. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of what brought you into this, and what kind of uh, you guys seem to have a real passion for these uh, kind of documentaries? And you know, quite honestly, I like I enjoy watching them. Yeah, no, so do we. You know, we've always been fans, Chris and I, of like behind the scenes featurettes and, you know, you know, back in the day with DVDs, getting onto the bonus features. But obviously we started our career 10 years ago working together, me, Chris and Adam, from Cult Screen and Dead Match Productions. And we did obviously the Leviathan, the Story of Hellraiser, and Fright Night, and we did Stephen King's It. But we always wanted, and obviously then we've obviously worked on RoboDoc and obviously Peace Academy, things like that. We always wanted to do a, a kind of like project on a person as opposed to a film where we could actually really get inside somebody's head about their career. Because it's great when we do things like Fright Night, we can talk to Tom Holland about Fright Night. But we didn't really, we don't really talk about, you know, Psycho 2 and Finner and things like that. So on this one, it was about obviously getting into somebody's head who's an icon. And for us and, and for me, uh, you know, as well, Robert is the ultimate icon of our generation, really, in regards to horror. He's just come on the end of like Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing from the 70s, late 70s, finishing off Hammer Horror. Obviously, I know they went on to do things like you know, Star Wars and obviously Lord of the Rings, Christopher Lee and Gremlins. But in terms of horror icons, obviously, it was it was Robert. And I've been a fan of Robert since I was a kid. So it was just one of those things we had to do. it, And we were absolutely amazed. Nobody else had done it before. Of Robert, it's so strange that this icon exists and no one's you know done a documentary on him. So it was you know serendipity for us that it all and we were the ones that got to do it and you know that was brilliant for us as filmmakers and fans yeah well, one of the things i really appreciate about this is i always thought robert england was a, a great actor um but he's and you guys touch on this in the documentary he's kind of uh he's kind of relegated to freddy krueger that's what he's known for and it's uh on one hand, it's a good thing because if you're an actor, that's what you want. You want, you know, constant work. You want to be known for something. But on the other hand, like I get the sense that he wanted to kind of branch out and try other things, and that's kind of the uh, double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, and that was kind of the main dramatic hook. I think we found for this project. You know, we Kane Hodder's had his documentary, uh, Danny Trejo, and they've all got like a dramatic hook. Kane with a stunt accident gone wrong. Danny Trejo, you know, prison and everything. And we we constantly kind of talked in the early points of like, okay, well, you know, when I think we first talked about this project, it's like, what what is there to pluck out of Robert's career? You know, and, we, and the thing is, if there's no drama, there's no drama. But if anything, if there's a, any kind of hook to this and portraying it, what's the word, in the most honest way possible, is that, like you said, the double-edged sword, the dichotomy of playing such a big icon, limiting you to you know just sort of one one thing really you know what you're known for and i think that's kind of what we've tried to tailor the whole doc around the the mission statement was to let's do anything but nightmare on elm street but let's accept that it's gonna be in there in places and you know quite prominent in some respects but about you know we we kind of fashioned that opening and closing with the silhouette of oh let's try and be symbolic i'm sure someone will say what a bunch of bullshit but you know i, I, I thought it looked good i thought it looked yeah, good so I just take, take off go. the glove um i think we were kind of like oh it'd be cool if it's on a stage what if he takes off the glove and that's symbolic that mm -hmm. you know he's ready to let go of freddie for a bit and then you kind of you have some dramatic beats throughout the story you know of oh god what am i doing do i really want to do this then accepting it um and then kind of coming to terms with it and then that's why we kind of then but at the end of the dock, like, oh, he walks off and then he grabs a glove. And that's symbolic because he's accepted who he is. So, you know, a bit <laughs> pretentious on our parts doing that. It looks pretty. But um, I think that's what's been quite fun is how do we approach Not Run Elm Street, which has already had like a four hour documentary from our friends, Tommy Hudson and Mike Perez. You know, let's how do we come into Nightmare on Elm Street at a different angle? Let's talk about how it impacted his life. Let's talk about how apeshit it went in the grand scheme of things with pop culture. And also, this is coming out on screen box and digital on June 16th, 2023. Um, was this uh was this a documentary you guys had previous to Screenbox, or did Screenbox hire you to do this documentary on Robert England? Like what was the what was the birth of this documentary? 
Yeah, on our previous docs, like, you know, with Leviathan and with Fright Night, they were all kind of like uh, South made for our company called Screens Dead Man's Productions and have distributed it by ourselves. And we've licensed them since, obviously, to many, many people who have done bonus features, obviously, on, on those franchises. But yeah, we, we all set out to do our own projects. And obviously, you know, there was always an intention that we'd do it ourselves, release it ourselves, and obviously, and, and that would be it. And we obviously engage with Screenbox through our uh, our colleagues, uh, Lawrence Gornall and Hank Starr, who are producers over here. And it kind of, it just kind of stamped a bit of kind of like, you know, um, uh, how can I put it? Um, made it more legitimacy. legitimacy, yeah, for us really. And I think because it was Robert as well, it had to be really legitimate, obviously, because it's about his career. And it's just, a, a, you know, a global kind of interest in Robert's career. So, yeah, so we obviously, we optioned it to Screenbox and they did, a, it was a bidding war actually with a, a couple of other um, well-known uh, distributors who wanted it. But we just really felt with Screenbox, again, this is not obviously bigging them up too much, that they kind of got us, you know what I mean? And we had full creative control of the project. Uh, we'd worked with them obviously on Pennywise. Uh, we're working everyone with on, on RoboDoc as well. But we kind of, we had a lot of interest from, from all other, other distributors. But we kind of felt at home with Screenbox, really. And I think this feels at home with it as well. And they're really going above and beyond in regards to the release. You know, it's getting a physical release with exclusive steelbooks. Oh, nice. It's getting, obviously, collector's edition releases. It's getting potential, obviously, merchandise from it as well, as well as, obviously, the, the streaming. It's been handled really nice. And I think we wanted that for Robert. We were very, we were very um, sure that we wanted Robert's legacy to be handled in a really kind of professional way. And they've done it for us. So, yeah, so we've kind of, we, we work with them collaboratively in the post-production of it. Yeah. I, yeah, I, re I really enjoyed this documentary. And, of course, you guys have Lynn Shea, and she's one of my favorites. So uh, I, I always like to take time to pray at the altar of Lynn Shea. But uh, what, what was it kind of like doing uh, just, uh, not just Lynn Shea, but just uh, doing the interviews in general? It, it must have been, uh, I'm I'm assuming you guys are horror fans, so that just must have been yeah. a complete delight. Oh yeah, you got You got to. You got to kind of like switch yourself off a bit when it when it, when someone walks in. Like I think I remember we we had it with RoboDoc. I remember because I'm a big Twin Peaks fan and Ray Wise. And the situation with Lance Henriks on the, on this for me felt very much the same. Where he was 15, 20 minutes late, and Gary and I, you know, typical white paley skinned or red skinned Celts, you know, sort of sitting outside this studio baking our asses off it's like where's Lance where's Lance is he coming he's coming and all oh, the build-up the nerves you get when these people first rock up and then you've just got to switch on you can't you kind of do automatically switch into like right business is business now but all of them were just so great and I think plucking out two examples three actually Robert included for Gary on his first interview Lance for me and um Eli Roth I swear to God, it all that happened was, so, can you introduce yourself, please? Three hours later, they've pretty much answered everything. You're like, and, you know, like, oh, what else do you want to ask me? You're like, um, did you say what your name was? <laughs> no, I know, you've just covered everything. Like, it was unbelievable. It was surreal, you know, and it was great. Obviously, we managed to sort of, you know, uh, give a bit of direction to some of these interviews, but some of them would just go on. And I think it's a testament. It's, you know, you, you choose people for a reason and you don't just get in, oh, we'll have this person for face value or this and that. They've all got reasons to be there. You know, I think a friend of mine said, oh, of course you've got Corey Taylor in there. You know, he's in everything, 80s horror doc. But Corey worked with Robert on Fear Clinic. Eli Roth uh, worked on 2001 Maniacs, Mick Garris, Freddy's Nightmares. So the beauty is, and it showcases that these people who were chosen, when they sit down, they do their interview and there's very little direction you have to give them. You're like, that's why you were chosen to be in this. So, but yeah, I mean, it's you, you, you pinch yourself afterwards. I think you're like, holy shit, I just sat down with Bishop from Aliens or something like that. You know, it's, but when you're in the moment, you kind of forget yourself a bit. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, I wish I kind of absorbed that more at the time. But you're more focused on, you yeah, get back done, the yeah. Board, you know, the, the job comes first in this instance. But, you know, don't get me wrong, every time we're watching something like Murder She Wrote now, me and my wife or something, or, you know, if I've got aliens, I was like, oh, look, it's my mate. She's like, no, it's not your mate, babe. You just interviewed him. So uh. <laughs> I also got the sense that like Robert England kind of enjoys the fame. But to someone uh, coming at you saying, hey, we're going to do a documentary about you. Was there any sort of trepidation or pushback or was he just all in or like because like, you know, you, you watch a doc on someone 
and you just kind of take it for granted. But like, if someone came to either of you two guys, like if I came to you guys and said, I'm doing a documentary about you, it'd be like, yes, uh, you do what? It. Why? <laughs> oh God, um, let's get those skeletons out the closet. Yeah. He, he the, obviously the first conversation we had with him about the doc, he was quite clear that he would, he, I think he said something along the lines, if this is a documentary about Freddie, I'll give you an interview, no problem. But if it's about my career, I will be fully engaged, you know, and, and that's and that's how we pitched it anyway. We pitched it very much. This is going to be about the man behind the glove, basically. It wasn't just about Freddie. And Robert said, I understand Freddie's important, but obviously, and he's going to be in it, but hopefully you'll explore other stuff. And he gave us a list of films, what he wanted us to explore. And I think, you know, when we first met him, obviously, properly for the interview, we obviously met him in London, we had a meal with him, and we met, went to meet him, obviously, at his house in Laguna Beach. And I think when we met him there, he was very programmed, you know. We, I asked one question, and literally, as Chris said, three hours later, he finished his whole career. And it was very kind of, oh, I don't know, it was so overwhelming had we got what we wanted. By the time we got to interview three and four, we interviewed him four times, he was very relaxed with us. He got to know us. And I think he was a lot more talking about his personal life and about he's kind of like, you know, the, the whole issues around the double-edged sword of being Freddie, the curse and the blessing. So I think we pitched it very much. It was about your career and it's not just about Freddie. Then as we moved along, it, it, we became really friendly with him and Nancy and they became very comfortable with us and opened up to us. And I think, you know, when they're getting text messages off them and, you know, Robert's phone you on a, you know, on a Friday evening just because he forgot something about, you know, he hadn't mentioned something, in, you know, in, in the cut or can we just look at this bit and change this bit possibly or did he say the right thing? That relationship really builds and it's really strong. So, yeah, so at start it was very much a, a job, you know, we loved him. He didn't know us. He embraced us to, in a, to the degree and allowed us into his life. Well, then I think he fully then accepted us as, as as film fans, if anything. And, you know, we're both film fans. And Adam, our, our partner, is a film fan as well. I think when he knows it's not about making money for us, and it isn't, you know, this is because we love these people, uh, you know, and, and it's become a career for us to a degree, but it's about our love for, for the genre. It, it, they know when, you, when you're not taking the piss, basically. They know when you're being serious, and it's not just about ticking a box. Yeah, because it's questions you ask, you know, and it's the the stories you want, and you go in there without a bit of paper, you know what you're going to ask them, and you know how to you know, segue to answer and questions because you've done your research. And I think he appreciates that. Well, speaking of segues, and uh, like uh, Robert doesn't only want to talk about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm sure you guys don't only want to talk about Hollywood dreams and nightmares. I saw your dog Diddy's specifically the offer. Yeah. Um, that was fantastic. And I've never heard of Dark Diddies before this week. So what can you um, say about that? Uh, I, I know that uh, you can rent the episodes individually for like $1.99 yeah. on uh, Amazon. But uh, the offer was fantastic. And I'm looking forward to uh, checking out the rest of them. What what can you tell me about Dark Diddies and kind of how that got started and just your involvement in that? I think it started because we we both wanted to do some narrative. I think we had done a lot of documentaries ourselves. Uh, about other people's work and we'd been to I remember we went to a uh, Fright Fest in London we were invited there to do a screening I think or something like that about Fright Night and I remember sitting there thinking we could do this you know all these people are queuing up and lying up in the red carpet and we both have lots of ideas so obviously we, me and Chris obviously engaged a chap called Neil Morris and we kind of worked with him on the offer and Chris was really heavily involved in the offer uh, directing that episode and, you know, it, it came as kind of like our labour of love of film, really. And, you know, it's it's got its faults. You know, it's, it's seven years old now, that episode is. Um, and then Chris came on board now, obviously, for the later series, executive producer. So, you know, Chris obviously has been concentrating on the, on the documentaries, but he's very much obviously part of the company. So, you know, we've developed the series and COVID kind of killed it a little bit for us, like it does with everybody else. You know, we got to episode five. We wanted to do episode six to finish the series off. But basically, it's a horror anthology series with uh, individual episodes that are all different, but there's a narrative thread going throughout. It's it's kind of like, it's going back, arc, arcing back to the old kind of, you know, uh, British kind of like, you know, um, Tales from the Unexpected and, you know, that kind of things, you know. So it, it's kind of labour of love for us, really. It was a little kind of bit of an outlet for us at one stage. Um, but again, it's kind of been put on the back burner a little bit because because of the docs. The docs have just literally got so kind of big in terms of obviously our relationship with Screenbox. Uh, obviously, we've got Pennywise just come out. Obviously, this one we're working 
on post, just finished post, obviously, and deliver delivering Robodox was a four part series. We've got another two parts of that series to do, series season two and three, which Chris is managing completely. Uh, and obviously, we've got Police Academy as a, as a four part series coming out. So it's kind of it, it's been great to have a little bit of an outlet on narrative, but we're kind of stuck with documentaries again at the moment. But I do appreciate you looking, you know, because they just sit there a little bit on Amazon and, you know, and it's nice people find them, to be honest. And they're there to be found. And it's, and it's a lot, you know, we enjoy when people appreciate them. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to checking out. the. I just watched the offer. It was the only one I've seen so okay. far. And it, it was really great. And it kind of yeah, kind of was a. Uh, Felt like a throwback to like the Masters of, I mean, you guys interview Mick Garris, but like the Masters yeah. of War kind of anthology. And anthology is like, there's something to say about shorts because they get in, they get out, they tell the story and it's like really, yeah. really good. They're not bloated and they're really fun to watch. No, it's really for when we did it, nobody was in anthologies when we did it. It was like, we were told anthology's dead, don't, don't bother. And now it's like huge kind of anthologies are. Uh, and, and shorts have become massive, you know. We've got a friend just in a, in a short who... Uh, one of our obviously actually cinematographer on this, uh, Richard Jackson, and he's doing really well with that. And it's just it's great to see people doing narratives. I know that me and Chris want to work on narrative together, uh, something different to the Ditties one day. And once we get all this done and we've made all these contacts now, and that's what the Ditties came from, the contacts we've made on Hellraiser. But I think now we've obviously developed as filmmakers and we've worked collaboratively together recently more than ever on this project. I think we we do actually work really well together, me and Chris, despite we have lots of arguments and, and tantrums. We, <laughs> I was going to say the yeah. offer, I've just got PTSD. Yeah, from yeah the it. offer, yeah, don't mention I mean, that. But if it's any consolation, the on. one thing I'll say is the offer was executed, actually filmed, with the exception of some extra stuff, I think Gary did. That bulk of that whole thing was shot in about 48 hours. Yeah. And by the end of it, you knew it was done in 48 hours. I think uh, apart no, from no, I didn't. Go in, please yeah. go on. We were, yeah, we were. Um, I mean, if the, yeah, I mean, as Gary said, I went, I got promoted from director to executive producer. That said something about my talents, <laughs> but I mean, we it was almost like we were young and dumb at that point, but um. Yeah, I mean, because Gary had primarily done the writing, and then he's like, oh, you want to direct, so I'll direct. And, oh, man, like, yeah, cool, first opportunity by so many people yeah, in one space. And people have been in Hellraiser and some of the younger actors, and, right, oh, we got to do this. And think trying to think continuity was one of the worst things. And I think, actually, I remember I lost... <laughs> I lost my handful of storyboards uh, the first hour of the shoot. So I was like, fuck, remember, remember, oh, I've got a photo I sent to someone on Messenger. Let's just do that. So it was fro it was a real kind of like, uh, what you call it, jump into the deep end of filmmaking. And then, as Gary said, because of my becoming the executive producer, it was like, right, I'll get back on to getting this backlog of documentaries through the door. But in all honesty, as Gary said, we've not been worked as close together despite working with each other <clears throat> in the 10 years. Hollywood Dreams was really where we were sat in here. The place still smells of him right now. Uh, <laughs> literally sat here like till four in the morning, making dramatic different changes and edits to this documentary in the space of a couple of weeks till four in the morning to get it over the line for Sitches last year. And with this, we've obviously shot some, um, in fact, Neil Morris, the writer of Dark Ditties, is actually in the documentary playing that chat show host that Robert met as a kid. And, um, <clears throat> <clears throat> he's the um silhouette at the beginning and end as well <laughs> nice. well so, uh, it, it, it's been a pleasure having you guys on and uh i, I hope you come back for a robo doc and if uh dark ditties oh, comes out I, I will have watched all of them by then but, uh, <laughs> but you, you guys were a great pleasure to have on here and no, no, thank, thank you, you for joining me it. we appreciate you thank you